Hi, I'm Judy Gallagher, and as a child, I spent many a happy day with my family at the zoo. As an adult, I have traveled to other states and countries to see exotic wildlife. But now that COVID-19 has confined me to spots close to home, I wanted to share a different kind of zoo with you all, one that you too could find by going to your local park or perhaps even in your yard. Let's start with the primate house. This is a monkey beetle, so-called because it is so hairy. They feed on flowers and foliage, so that's where you should look for them. This weird looking thing is a monkey slug caterpillar. It is also hairy, although it has rather more appendages than the mammal monkey. This is also called a hag moss, as each appendage resembles the disheveled locks of a hag. As a note of caution, many hairy caterpillars, including this one, sting. What looks like hairs are really toxin-bearing spines. Now we're moving on to the big cats. The eastern tiger swallowtail, Virginia's state insect, has tiger stripes. These tigers are puddling, a behavior where male butterflies seek out salts and amino acids in mud. This apparently makes them more virile. Females occasionally puddle, but they don't congregate like this. While the adult may look like a tiger, the eastern tiger swallowtail caterpillar looks like a snake. Those fake eyes are rather realistic. There are a number of tiger species in our zoo. Here's a Virginia tiger moth, one of many tiger moth species. The tiger name is derived from one of the tiger moth's most common genera. That's the plural of genus, the first part of the scientific name. These moths have wings with red or orange spots and white stripes, sometimes displayed in striking geometric patterns. This moth's back is pure white, so I like to think of it as a snow tiger. And here's a six-spotted tiger beetle named for its impressive jaws. They feed on just about anything they can see and catch, including invertebrates that might be larger than themselves. There are many other local species of tiger beetles, a few of which are pictured here. Clockwise from top left are oblique line tiger beetle, festive tiger beetle, splendid tiger beetle, and Virginia metallic tiger beetle. Tiger beetles are sometimes used to measure the health of the habitat. Tiger beetles are sensitive to changes in the environment including the use of pesticides, misuse of habitat, and climate change. So if you see tiger beetles, it's an indicator that the ecosystem is somewhat stable. Here's an Asian tiger mosquito, and yes, that is my blood that she is drinking. It is named tiger because of its conspicuous stripes. The female requires a blood meal to develop her eggs, but the males feed on nectar and other plant juices. We have a lion in our local zoo too, an ant lion. This is an adult. Aren't the eyes gorgeous? This is a picture of the larva drawn by my talented husband, Jimmy. The larva is a voracious predator of ants, which is how it got the ant lion name. Some ant lion species adults eat other insects, but many other ant lion adults survive on nectar and pollen. This is a leopard moth not taken locally but it looks similar to the giant leopard moth that we have here. If you use your imagination, you can see a similarity to a leopard's markings. Although many moth caterpillars are host specific, meaning that they can only eat one type of plant, the leopard moth caterpillar is a generalist feeding on many different plant species. We have dogs in our zoo too. This is a bee wolf. As the name suggests, these wasps prey on bees. The adult wasps stings a bee, paralyzing most of its involuntary muscles, but the venom doesn't kill the bee. The bee wolf carries the bee to a burrow in the ground and lays an egg on it. The paralyzed bee serves as live food for the bee wolf larva. There are other wolves in our zoo too. This is a rabid wolf spider. Um, you don't normally see them on flowers like this. I was a bit surprised, but it certainly looks cool uh, sitting up there. The Latin name of this family, Lycosidae, comes from the Greek word lycosa, meaning wolf. There are a number of genus names in this family named after animals, including Lycosa for wolf, Alapex for fox, Arctos for bear, and Pardosa for panther. Mammal wolves can have litters of up to 14 pups. The wolf sp spider can beat that. Here is one carrying dozens of her babies on her back. 
No zoo would be complete without an elephant, which is an exceptionally large mammal. This is the elephant mosquito, which is an exceptionally large mosquito. It is a good mosquito in that its larvae prey upon smaller mosquito larvae, including species that can carry diseases like West Nile virus. There are lots of hookstock in our miniature zoo too. Here is a buffalo, the buffalo tree hopper, named for its horns. The horns make the tree hopper look a lot like a thorn on a branch, effectively camouflaging it. This is a gazelle scarab, also known as the brown dung beetle. It was named because it was found on gazelle dung in Africa, and it was deli deliberately introduced into the United States to help with dung control. This is a reddish brown stag beetle. It gets its name from its mandibles or mouth parts, which look a little like stag antlers. The males use their mouth parts to wrestle with each other over favored mating sites, much like male deer or stags fight over territory. We also have several zebra species in our zoo. Here's a zebra swallowtail named for its zebra stripes. Did you know that the zebra swallowtail caterpillar is cannibalistic? If two caterpillars are close together, one will likely eat the other. And here's a moth called the zebra conchalodes, also because of its stripes. The young feed on daisies and other asters. The zebra longhorn beetle is also named for its stripes. The adults are usually found on flowers and the larvae like decaying pine log. Moving along in our hoof stock, this beautiful creature is a deer fly. It's not named for its resemblance to a deer, but rather for the female's habit of drinking deer blood. I can attest to the fact that they also love human blood, but their eyes are gorgeous, so I put up with them. Speaking of gorgeous eyes, a closely related fly is the horse fly, also named after the type of blood it likes. And yes, it also loves to feast on human blood. Aren't the eyes mesmerizing? Male eyes are not as colorful. This is a camel cricket named for its hump. This is the annoying creature that invades my basement every fall. Rob Dunn, a professor at North Carolina State University, started the study of camel crickets in 2012 and asked the public to send him pictures of the camel crickets in their basement. Rob had expected to get pictures of the native camel crickets, but to his surprise, most pictures were of two species of Asian camel crickets that had apparently evolved to be able to live in the drier, cooler conditions of houses. They further studied the numbers by setting traps around various houses to extrapolate the total number of these introduced species. The result was that there are likely 700 million camel crickets living mostly unnoticed in our homes. Here is a rhinoceros beetle. This is a female and doesn't have the horn that makes the male beetle loosely resemble a rhinoceros. The horn is used in fighting other males in mating season and also for digging. Occasionally an exotic finds its way into our zoo. This giraffe was seen recently at a nearby wildlife management area. We have some species in our zoo that are named after smaller animals too. This is a mole cricket, so-called because it lives underground like a mole. It is carnivorous and particularly likes fire ants, which endears it to me. This is an American ermine moth, named because it resembles the winter coat of the ermine, a type of weasel. And no trip to the zoo would be complete without seeing a bear. Here's a woolly bear caterpillar. Amusingly, this is the larva of a tiger moth. According to folklore, the amount of black on the woolly bear in autumn varies proportionately with the severity of the coming winter in the locality where the caterpillar is found. The longer the woolly bear's black band, the longer, colder, snowier, and more severe the winter will be. Now we're going to visit the exotic birdhouse in our zoo. This charming creature is a peacock fly. Its markings are decorative like a peacock's feathers, and it dances around looking like a very tiny strutting peacock. This is an io moth, also known as the peacock moth. As you can see, the hind wings have the same markings as the peacock's feathers. This is a hummingbird clearwing moth, a sphinx moth named for its resemblance to a hummingbird. It hovers like a hummingbird too. Unlike most moths, this moth flies during the day. This is an owl fly named because its scientific name means resembling a screech owl. 
I personally don't see this resemblance, but it's a cool looking insect nonetheless. Like dragonflies, they are fast flying aerial predators, but they aren't closely related to dragonflies. There's a group of moths called, called owlets, supposedly because their eyes reflect a light shone on them at night, just like an owl's eyes. You can see a hint of that in this picture of a morbid owlet taken on our deck. Although most owlet moth adults are dull colored, some of the caterpillars are colorful or have interesting shapes. On the left is a curved lined owlet caterpillar, which gains protection from predators by mimicking a dead leaf blowing in the wind. On the right is a brown hooded owlet caterpillar. Still in the exotic bird enclosure, here is a crane fly, named because the legs are very long, just like the birds of the crane family. This particular species is a wood boring crane fly, and you can see that she is boring her abdomen into this log to lay her eggs. We don't want to miss the reptile house. This strange looking creature is a lizard bark louse, one of about 400 species in this family. I spent some time trying to find out why these are called lizard bark lice, but was unsuccessful. There is another bark louse family called false lizard bark lice, and I don't know why they are called that either. This is a slender lizard beetle. Lizard beetles are a tribe within the pleasing fungus beetle family. Once again, I was unable to find out why they are called lizard beetles. Continuing in the reptile house, this is a snake fly, so-called because of its neck is snake-like. Although it's called a snake fly, it isn't a snake and it isn't a fly, being from an entirely different order of insects. Here's a cobra club tail, a dragonfly whose tail resembles the cobra's head. The adults fly for a few weeks, but the aquatic nymphs may have lived for up to three years in a nearby stream or river. It's easy to find them at Riverbend Park in early May. This is a big-eyed toad bug, a true bug that looks like a tiny toad and also hops like a tiny toad. It also blends into its surroundings like a tiny toad. Unlike toads, this insect can bite painfully, something I was not expecting when I picked one up years ago. I won't make that mistake again. We'll end our tour of the reptile house with the golden tortoise beetle, named because it looks like it has the shell like a tortoise. The adult is beautiful, but my favorite tortoise beetle is a different species, the thistle tortoise beetle. Here's the larva of the thistle tortoise beetle. To keep itself from being eaten by a predator, it covers itself with a poop shield made from its own feces. No one wants to eat poop, so the larva typically lives to be an adult. Here's this little charmer with its poop shield up. It takes some work to maintain our zoo. As I'm sure you've all heard, insects in general appear to be in decline. One issue is degradation and loss of habitat. So one way to help our zoo is to make sure that politicians know that it is important to preserve habitat. But it's obviously a challenge to be effective in that way. So here are two things that you can do that are more within your control. First, avoid using pesticides, especially broad-based ones that kill species other than the target species. Secondly, plant native plants to provide habitat and nutrition for our zoo inhabitants. Our zoo species will thank you and so will the birds that depend on them for food. Our crops will get pollinated and we'll all be able to eat well. I hope you've enjoyed our trip to the zoo and I encourage you to look for all of these extraordinary creatures the next time you're outside.